Thank you. Thank, thank, thanks, everybody, for coming. It's great to see a nearly full house. Thank you. And um, thanks very much to IFLAS for inviting us to talk. Um, I hope through the course of the evening, uh, what we share with you will explain what our practice is about um, and the way that Rob and I, um, largely tonight focused on the Lake District, how we inquire into um, the many elements that make up an environment that is actually quite complex. Um, I'm going to open with a poem um, that I wrote following a recent um, conference about communicating environmental change. Where do you want to walk? Shall we stroll together through the valley of despair, kick our feet through leaves of fear, brush against obstacles in industry, academia, politics? Shall we wander in the fog endlessly? Shall we retreat? Or shall we stride up to the heights to feel the light and take a wider view? Shall we be ambitious and push modesty away, negotiate obstacles, face uncertainty, keep our feet on the ground, earthed, and as a community, propose a new roadmap? We have seen <coughs> coral reefs dying. We have imagined their passing. We have modelled their death. We have imagined summer fields without butterflies. We have watched decline. We have modelled depletion. We have imagined a world without wild. What else might we imagine from the sunlit heights? Can we imagine a rapid end to the toxic emission of carbon dioxide to the warming? Can we imagine forests growing or the ocean clean? Can we make that happen? Now that's, um, I think, thinking on, on the very global scale of what we're up against at the minute um, in 2019. Uh, but we're going to bring things back to the Lake District, and um, here we are in the heart of the Lake District. Uh, that is also a World Heritage Site, and I imagine that most people here have an idea about what a World Heritage Site is, what the cultural landscape is. Um, so I've taken some information from the nomination document, um, and the Lake District is... Uh, has outstanding universal values. It's something cultural and natural where man and nature work together. And as a World Heritage Site, it's considered so exceptional as to transcend national boundaries and to be of common importance for present and future generations of all humanity. Um, in the Lake District specifically, there's kind of three main criteria. Uh, one, as a cultural landscape where this beautiful land that's been shaped by glaciers has also been crafted over time, largely by the farming industry, uh, which results in stone walls, field patterns, um, and also by forestry and woodland practices as well. Then there's the inspiration element, Wordsworth, the romantic movement, the picturesque, and that continues to have an impact on the way people perceive this place today. And... Um, it was also very important in the whole conservation movement, inspiring the creation of the National Trust, uh, the national parks, and protected areas. So Cumbria University is also the centre for national parks and protected areas. So we're in a good place to talk about the World Heritage Site and what that means. The thing about the World Heritage Site, some people say, oh, no, you just want everything to stop and be preserved as if in aspic. In aspic. But... It looks at the landscape as an evolving landscape that can change. Um, it's an organic landscape. It can never be frozen at one point in time and will continue to change, reflecting the evolution of how communities interact with it. <coughs> development in the past has left a cultural legacy. So too, development in the present and future will create new cultural values. What those values might be we don't know. Um, something that comes up a lot in conversation about the Lake District National Park, um, specifically, I think, in relation to the pressures of grazing on the land um, and tourism, as well as some industries, is what happens to the natural environment and how habitats need to be well looked after, 
biodiversity needs to be enhanced. Um, <coughs> looking after the natural environment in principle should trump other decisions, should, should be considered as the most important, and that harks back to the Sanford principle, which has been revised a little bit since then, but that's the crux of it. That's easier to remember, I think. Um, a lot more straightforward. You, you mess about with some things and other things are affected. You move some things around and other things are affected. It is always the case. Uh, so, when things get tricky, I reckon you bring in the artist. Why not? Um, some creative thinking, um, some creative ways of looking at things slightly differently, uh, from left field maybe, to actually shake things up uh, and look at things a little differently. Trouble with that. So those are the, some of the places we've been to, some of the people we've met, some of the desks we've sat behind, some of the landscapes we've been over the last sort of few years. So you put yourself in different positions, you hear lots of different things that are very compelling, and you, it all goes into the mix, it all feeds into the mix. And when somebody tells you one thing, it sounds really interesting, really compelling, and then somebody tells you something completely different, and that sounds interesting and compelling. So it's a devil's job to try and work out where the, the balance might be with all that. Harriet and I formed Somewhere Nowhere about 2011, September 2011. Um, it started with the wrapping of this tree, this uh, dead tree near Windermere, uh, which we wrapped in undyed Herdwick wool. As you can see, we took the logo from that tree, uh, and the name Somewhere Nowhere comes from a poem by uh, Anne Stevenson, a British poet who spent most of her life in America, and it inspired Harriet to take up poetry. We got to meet the lady, Anne Stevenson, about five years ago. She's an academic, works at Durham. Um, we sat around a tea table with her, drinking tea, eating cake uh, with her and her husband. And she spoke for about two hours about literature and the role it plays in today's society and the way it plays in terms of framing the Lake District. So she had some thoughts on that. The world has changed so monumentally since Wordsworth was alive that you can't identify the Lake District he all but invented any longer with literature, she said. And then she went on to talk about romantic and nature and how she sees it possibly being affected by uh, development. Landkeepers was the first project which we set out to do back in 2012. Over a two-year period, uh, we spent a lot of time with the hill farmers uh, wandering across the fells, getting to know their backyard, their office. You know, we'd come... Both our, Harriet and I moved to the Lake District to be closer to the landscape that we really love, we really enjoy, but we only knew it from one point of view, and that is from getting out of a car, going up a hill perhaps, staring around, eating our sandwiches, coming back down. But the time we spent with the hill farmers showed us another way. This was a light bulb moment for us, gathering off the hills in the Dudden Valley with a, a shepherd over that way, Anthony Hartley. Uh, six hours of scrambling around the fells by Coniston, it really showed us a different way of viewing the landscape. We weren't going on the normal footpaths. We were on shepherd's trods, walking on landscape that he had walked, his father had walked, and his grandfather had walked. The same kind of area over a long period of time. It's a different way of seeing the landscape. I, I like to shoot using old-fashioned film. Uh, so wherever possible, I make portraits of the people I'm meeting with and talking to. Um, just to get them standing proudly in their environment, in their space. Um, so I think that's quite a, a strong quote from uh, Aldo Leopold. I'm not going to read it all out. So that's something that he said in a book in the 40s, which I think holds true yeah, today. Yeah, and I like that because it's the idea of the landscape itself sh shaping the cultures that grow from place and how that's distinct wherever you find yourself in the world. So moving on from sort of showing other people's quotes, we think it's really important that you put the person's quotes next to their own image, so it adds power. So you've got the Sam and Can Hodson, friends of ours who farm in the Glencoin, uh, uh, Glencoin near Oldswater, saying their words. We do a lot of talking around kitchen tables, um, chatting with farmers. Sometimes they're formal interviews that we would transcribe afterwards, um, always over cups of tea and cake. Um, always a really comfortable environment for them and we just sort of 
have a, have a chat for an hour and a half or so just to get their sense of place, what it means to them to be attached to their landscape. Um, and, you know, like going gathering as well, we've, we've liked to get involved in what goes on, just get a feel for things. Um, and this, yeah, quite an awkward moment getting handed a sheet to hold at a show. Uh, it's really not very easy. Um, but we, you know, we've tried to spend as much time as possible in an environment that's unfamiliar to us and to learn and to feedback through our work how the people whose everyday life that is um, experience it. Um, and of course, there's the reason for farming um, as producing meat. So going to abattoirs is, is something that we wanted to do to get an insight um, into the whole journey for sheep. Um, but also spending days walling on the fells, find out what that feels like. And in the process of doing that, you have a nice long day with people and uh, it's amazing what you learn while walling. Um, but it's not just farmers that uh, we talk to through the Land Keepers Project and that uh, we began to talk to ecologists, people who understood uh, details about the environment and how it works. Uh, this is Deb Land from Natural England, who's a peatland specialist um, and knows a lot about grasslands. We're in a rare limestone pavement setting here and she's explaining all the plants to me. Um, Pete Leeson, who's a woodland specialist and... Um, he is really keen to have more trees in the landscape and uh, that's a, a wish that we share as well, more, more trees if possible. He said it would be delightful to think we could give a little extra space so that the trees could set seed naturally and create new woods for the future. Uh, there is a lot of work being done across the park to plant new trees um, and a lot more work that could possibly be done and the controversial question of whether to put more fencing in to allow trees to have succession long term. Could talk about that all night. Um, so we do a lot of learning from other people. Um, this is out on uh, Glen Ridding Common with um, the John Muir Trust have just taken over management of that and Pete Barron uh, leading a walk. So we're kind of learning about the environment from that perspective and the alpine plants that are coming in below Halvelin. Um, and then more recently through the University of Cumbria on a weekend looking at wild pedagogy, different ways of teaching, different ways of um, <coughs> getting in touch with the environment. Yeah, so that was uh, a good three days spent over in Wild Ennerdale, a place we don't know very well, but it just opened up our eyes once more to, to something different. We don't just learn from others. What we also try to do is to pass on what we've learned, what we've heard from other people. So this is Harriet reading some poetry written in place up on Stony Cove Pike as part of the last project. We did a series of walks through the Longview, uh, which were fully subscribed over the course of six months. And it was great just showing the landscape from different points of view. And it was, it was, we got some really interesting feedback on the back of that. Six form students from Manchester, inner city Manchester, uh, staying at the Blencather Field Study Centre. We took them up to one of the trees we've been working with at Little Asby. And one of the overriding memories of mine was seeing these uh, young people going to the edges and just looking at the space that was there because they're not used to seeing such wide open space. So Harriet's reading poetry written about that tree underneath that tree. One of the uh, three sculptures we created last year, tree folds we've called them, uh, planting with the National Trust over by Oldswater with the local primary school, Patterdale Primary School, who we've spent a lot of time with working outside in the environment, but also creating artwork in their classroom. So it's, it's embedding that learning continually about outside stuff coming back indoors and trying to get the children to understand about their place. We've just recently started working on a project called Our Common Cause, uh, specifically led by the Foundation for Common Land, which is looking at social cohesion on commons. If you don't know what commons are, then there's the big areas of landscape uh, across the United Kingdom that are owned by somebody, but other people have the right to graze them or to do other things on them. They've got an inalienable right, which goes back 800 years or so, I think. So we spent time on Ingleborough, uh, with a group of grazers there, understanding about their place. But once again, it's also about talking to farmers, to grazers in their kitchens, to find out about what they feel about their place. 
And the, yeah, this we asked uh, John what it is that keeps him going, and um, it was the sound of the curlew for him. And after after he'd said that, we went outside to take the picture, and five curlew flew overhead. We'd booked them. A wonderful moment. We did. <laughs> yeah, and he he did say when I was taking the pictures, if the curlews ever stopped calling, he would leave the farm. Interesting. We're going to come back to curlews in a wee while because they've become a very symbolic. Um, part of what we're doing work-wise. So as well as Yorkshire, we've also spent quite a bit of time down in Dartmoor, a few weeks here and there, just going down to meet with the grazers to look at the landscape to get a sense of that place. So we were down there in February this year. In deep snow, it was br brilliant just driving around the top of the moors when there's nobody else around. Great place to go. And then today, this came into our inbox. Somebody sent me the link to this article that appeared in The Independent yesterday. And it's talking about you know, farmers doing, doing wrong or farmers being part of the problem for the environment and the state of the environment. So this, this appeared in the independent, as I said, yes, yesterday online. So and yeah, Kevin Cox said farming policies are driving farmers to work in a way which is increasingly damaging the environment. So. And we met with Kevin and his uh, wife in their house when we were doing the Dartmoor project because coincidentally, he's just bought a piece of common land on commons that we're looking at down in Dartmoor. So it was interesting then sort of seeing what he has to say about <coughs> integral working. Um, and what it, what it shows sometimes that the newspapers will pick up a story and run with the most sensational aspects that sells articles. You know, it seems that the, the way that newspapers set up is predicated on conflict. And then another commoner, a grazier, just down the road from um, Kevin and Donna, Interesting to hear what he said about it. Am I going to, going to be able to shape the future of this common? I don't know. I feel like I've got my opinions about the future of this common and the way I think it should go, but I feel like what will actually happen will have nothing to do with me. Somebody else will decide that. Lightening up a bit. Yeah, we'll change the pace a little bit um, because it is quite difficult always thinking about these different points of view. Um, but I wanted to introduce a little bit of poetry from Mary Oliver um, and the idea of the geese flying over and over, announcing your place in the family of things and to just bring in that idea again about how everything is connected even though people seem to talk about divisions an awful lot. Um, and that was um, something that the Nick Heesman shared with us. We were uh, showing an exhibition down in Brighton and so we sought out a policy officer for South Downs National Park so we could find out more about the park, specifically about trees. Um, we thought we'd be sitting around a desk and looking at facts and figures, but Nick uh, took us on a little tour for the, for the whole day, in fact, to some of his favourite trees. And um, he sees man and nature as not separate at all. And the most special tree he took us to was this very old lime hidden away in a plantation of western red cedar um, and it was incredible to stand there. That's one tree. And, and now if we can get this to work... Everybody keep your fingers crossed, I'm going to hit the make a sound button if I can find it. I, I can see the button. Oh, you're on there, look, your arrow's on the screen. Down, oh, yeah, yeah. down, that's it. Yay! Here we go. We're in the South Downs National Park and we're, we're standing in a, a coppice stall of a lime, a hybrid lime, and general consensus is that this was the tree that was the climatic species, so this would have been the number one tree in the canopy when the Romans were here about 2,000 years ago. To see it here, it's, it's, it's like a, it is, it is a relic, but it's living, and so that's the great thing. It's, it's, it's very much natural heritage, but it has a cultural heritage and it taking us back to when our ancestors 2,000 years ago, how this landscape would have looked. So he brings in the idea there of natural, natural heritage and cultural heritage, which is again shared with the Lake District. But what we left with from that was an incredible sense of wonder that stayed with us for a very long time. Oh, look. We're not, we're not anymore, Nick. There. Um, so coming to that sense of wonder, you know, it doesn't always have to be the big, big things like that tree. This is sundew, or uh, drosera, on the shores of Wastwater, where it's very boggy. 
lovely carnivorous plant. Very fun if you can take a look at that. Um, or a tiny hairy caterpillar in the heather. It's northern northern egger moth. Yeah, for anybody who knows that. Um, or this in our hedge yesterday, just outside the front door, Rowan coming into bud, spring. But wonder isn't always uh, picture postcard stuff. And it can bring a lot of sadness. Um, every year we listen out for the curlews where we live, and it's lovely when we see them nesting and bringing up their young, but it's not so lovely when you find a dead one. This is hope challenged. This is hope fading. Lying in my hand, perfect body, eyes tight shut, wings the tiniest of things, not ready to fly, limp blue legs, dinosaur ancestry. This is the heavy weight of hope discarded. Here in the meadow among sorrel and buttercups and the heat of a cloudless sky, hope feathered and filched, flung to the ground and left alone, hopeless. I do not know if it was a crow that took this curlew chick or a fox. I do not know if the calls of the parent birds that have been circling and calling, circling and calling, circling and calling are calls of anger or sorrow or warning. But in those haunting high-pitched cues, I hear no hope. Hope lies here at my feet while the adults cry. New narrative. This is one of our installations, and I think it's quite apt because we, we think that sometimes a new narrative perhaps is needed. You had some thoughts on yeah, that, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, it is time for something to happen. We need a new narrative, but it's not so much the new narrative as the process that leads towards that. How do we work together to think about the next steps and how to care for the natural world around us. So we're bringing art into it and now practice of taking art out into the landscape started back in 2015 um, with this work, uh, a poem sent out on the back of sheep um, up onto the commons for three months over winter. It shuffled itself around, uh, went away, wasn't seen and then came back again. But that kind of triggered uh, the work that we've been doing since. As well as talking to professionals and ecologists, farmers and conservation bodies, we also try and mix it with artists whenever we can. Uh, this is a chap called David Nash who uh, has got a studio, got a practice in North Wales. He works in wood a lot. He's been sort of a practicing artist for the last 50 years now, I think. Uh, and this is one of his sculptures. Um, 22 ash trees planted in a circle in 1977. Uh, he's been shaping them over that period to form a dome. So in summer, you're inside this living cathedral of trees. Um, so we, we spent time with him uh, and heard from him. Just an incredibly peaceful place. When you have an idea, it hasn't got any molecules until you've not, uh, incarnated it in some way by making a sketch or making a note. If you don't do anything with it, it evaporates. You had your chance, it winked at you, you need to respond. And I think that's part of the creative process. You get an idea, you need to respond to that idea. Unfortunately, we heard last year that this sculpture is now suffering from ash dieback quite, quite badly, so it's not gonna outlast him, which is what he thought would happen. So just thinking about why art? What can it do in an environmental context? Um, and this seems to sum it up quite well. The art does not show people what to do, yet engaging with a good work of art can connect you to your senses, body and mind. It can make the world felt, and this felt feeling may spur thinking, engagement and even action. I think thinking about our work, it comes down to these four key ingredients. Uh, curiosity, as an artist, you're always curious to find out more, listen to other people, think about things. Relationships, we don't like to do things quick and easy. We like to actually spend time with, with people, with subjects, with ideas. And we do a, a lot of walking. You know, walking through the landscape freezes up to think, but it also places us bodily in that landscape. And everything happens over time. Uh, 
following on from the sort of the farmer project, uh, the Uplands Hill Farmer project, we did something called the Long View over two and a half years, closely um, <coughs> responding to seven trees spread across Cumbria. Uh, we called it a constellation of trees. So we spent say two and a half years going back and forth to these seven trees in all seasons, all weathers, night and day, just to get a sense about their place, using it as an excuse to uh, interrogate the landscape a bit more closely. Uh, through walking, a lot of walking, carrying lots of heavy gear, even our dog got involved with that, he was carrying heavy gear. Through camping, you know, finding these incredibly fantastic camp spots in the, in the Lake District. And through pausing, we do a lot of pausing in our work. You know, some of, the, some of it is actually getting there, but there's a lot of sitting around and a lot of just soaking up what is happening in that landscape. On the back of that project, we set out to do seven installations uh, to respond to the trees. This was a, a key moment in our kind of trajectory, as it were, you know, actually physically thinking about what we were going to do to respond to these trees. Um, so the first installation was this yellow line um, called Everything is Connected. It was linking up um, an oak tree with the shores of Waswater, and it carried a poem that ha Harriet had written about, about the landscape, about the place. Uh, Crucially, it had a line cut in the yellow line so that the footpath, about three quarters of the way down, could go through it. And it sort of became symbolic of our breaking of that line whenever it suits humans. You know, up to a point, everything is okay, we'll protect it, we'll protect it, up to the point where we need to do something ourselves as humans, <coughs> and then the line is broken. So it became, you know, quite a crucial way of thinking for us. It was yellow because we thought it needed to be quite seen. It was willpower and action because we thought nobody would see it if it was another colour. And we thought you could actually see it from space. It was, you can it was just about, big. you can see the break in the line up there. You as can well. actually see the break yeah. in the line just a little bit about there. Um, we didn't set out to cause a stir, but it did cause a bit of a stir, um, which is great because you want kind of some sort of reaction. If you're going to do something quite bold, you want a reaction. We made really um, carefully placed it so it wasn't going to blow away. We cut slits and let four trees that fell down the line sort of come up through it, and it was only there for six days. We got lots of comments on the back of that. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you read this one. It's funny, if you do something that's slightly different, the first noises that come out are really the angry voices, the negative voices. I, I don't know if that's human nature. Uh, but then the, the people that actually quite liked it or thought, thought about it a bit more came to, to that way of thinking. And, you know, quickly, there was lots of people fighting on, on, on the behalf of it. And that was an interesting point for us. You know, should only people who live in cities have access to art? Discuss. But come back yeah, with the answer, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question to ask in the Lake District that has cultural landscape and inspiration and romanticism and the picturesque um, as something to celebrate. You know, how, how do you treat art in a landscape like that? Um, anyway, so we carried on. We did seven installations as part of the Longview project, um, one for each tree. And this was the one that followed on from the yellow line. Uh, this was the haiku in the trees and a beautiful wood pasture in Glencoyne um, with orange wrapped around seven trees on the way up to this final tree which is the Glencoyne Pine. Um, and this installation was in place for roughly a month. Um, and one of the most special days was uh, taking a cellist up to play her cello in response to the wind and the tree. It was a wonderful moment. And this is on public access land. Um, we thought we were alone, but when she finished playing, there was applause from behind us. And there had been walkers that had come to see the piece and uh, had an impromptu concert, which was very lucky for them. Um, so um, another installation was at the Langstrath Birch. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, a samara is a winged, a winged seed. So birch trees spread their seed with winged seeds. Um, took 60 seconds for the water to come from the tree to this viewing point, so we strung 60 flags over the water. It's actually very difficult to hold them in place. We called this installation What Rises Above the White Noise. Trump had recently been elected, incredible amount of <coughs> fake news. Whose voices get heard? How do you know what to listen to? In this situation, a winged birch seed is definitely going to rise above the white noise, but we don't know what else. 
Um, we took the flags down, um, everything was okay, and then a farmer that we knew came up the valley, and that dog ate our sandwiches. Yeah, our sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't even looking. Which was not the intention for us. We were really hungry. Anyway, so we got to talking to him. We'd already cleared away, so he hadn't seen the piece, but um, how are you doing? He was looking, checking his sheep started talking about which voices were being heard about what happens in the valley. Uh, recent memories of Storm Desmond, horrible flooding throughout the Lake District, um, particularly in the Derwent Valley. Um, there's tree planting. He was even talking about Sellafield. You know, there's all these conflicting interests. And he was saying, well, I don't know if what I think gets heard. Who's getting listened to? And then we told him about the what we'd just done, and it seemed to be quite fitting. Um, the last installation that we did was at the tree we called the Troutbeck Alder, and very ephemeral, light, <coughs> and gentle. Um, we hung seven books from the tree, each with a small sapling in, and uh, called it the Space for Imagining. And one of the ideas behind that was the growth of new life in this compost of ideas and knowledge that we have, which is incredibly valuable but sometimes it sticks us in a place of not being able to move forward. So having this space around them suggests, you know, where can we go from here as we build this new narrative? What can we, what can we dream up? That's how they looked under the full moon with the snipe drumming, which is an incredible sound. Yeah, that's at midnight so yeah. in May. Yeah. Um, so we have the, the challenge then of we put artworks outside. They don't stay for very long. Not everybody sees them. Um, and then we translate that into gallery settings. And uh, it's been really, really fun to tour some of our work around the country. Um, we've had a lot of people come through. Yeah, about 100,000. Yeah, um, and a lot of great feedback. And it challenges us to present our work differently and to talk about it. So one of the seven trees is the Underhelm Sycamore. This sits in the Grasmere Valley within sight of Wordsworth's house, uh, the National Trust headquarters and uh, the A591 that goes to Keswick. And this tree has become the centre of our new project. So we're thinking about the Lake District as if it's got a, a clock face around it. There's 12 segments there and right at the centre is the Underhelm Sycamore. Is this going to work? I hope so. Yes. You can hear the Benny Hill soundtrack in your mind. I do. <laughs> so that's the title of the project, Sense of Here, in case you hadn't guessed. Uh, and it is about that. It's about a sense of here, about a sense of this place we call home, about what do we feel about this landscape that we love and love to be in. There's a website. We've just finished the website. Hallelujah. It's been um, a few weeks at the coalface of looking at machines and computers, and the Harriet's um, kind of done it. So if you want to look at that when you go home, we'd love you to. <coughs> Crucially, as I say, it's about, for us, it's about feeling of place, about getting outside. This was uh, up on Place Fell a few Sundays ago. We looked at the weather report. It said it was going to be really windy, very, very windy, and we thought, we're going out. Um, so we went up on the top of Place Fell. Harriet couldn't stand up, it was that blowy. Um, but we just got a sense of the elements about the wild. It felt truly wild up there. We didn't see anybody else up there on the top. No surprise there, I'm guessing. But it just felt really fantastic to have our senses opened up. This was up on, um, we camped as part of each of the months we're going around. We, we've got a commitment to camping in, in each of the sectors. So we're camping just below uh, Helvelin. And I'm going to press this now, and hopefully it works. Yes. It's about 7 o'clock in the morning. Yes, before the sun rose. It was freezing, absolutely freezing. The wind was blowing 40, 50 miles an hour. It looks quite calm and peaceful. Um, we were up way before it got light, so we could walk up from the campsite at Grisdale Tarn up onto the tops. To get this, you know, you only get this by getting up early, by being in that place, by getting that sensation, by having the right gear, it has to be said, you have to be dressed up warm. And it's worth it, it is so worth it. 
Skip forward a month. This was February, camped up by Angle Tarn. This was right at the end of the month, uh, that really warm spell that it had weather-wise. Um, Harriet got up for a pee in the night, which was great because it woke me up. I got up I thought, to see the stars. Harriet got up to see the stars in the night. She did. I remember now. She got up to see the stars. Well, tonight. if you're out there, you've got to, really, haven't you? Yeah. And that's under sort of a, a three-quarters moon um, and just showing you what it's like to be in that place at that time in the morning. Yeah, and the thing about camping is that we always make a point of is uh, watching the sun set, getting up to see the stars, and then watching the sun rise as well, and that beautiful point in the morning when it's quiet and still. And these are some notes that I wrote to Angle Tarn. The sky has found a pale to reflect the last blue-white of yesterday evening. Night has been a starred mirror for this repeat of winter days. The morning counts itself in with lines of light, knows nothing of the digital, paints the land a gold rose brown. Here by the tarn, the water holds sunlit hills. Two gooseanders float in silhouette, then soundlessly dive, disappear. Water spreads before me, shifting ripples. Imagine I could hang this scene like a painting in my mind, for it can exist nowhere else, this shimmer of gold on grey, and the morning slowly breathing, light on stones, lichen shining, not a single blade of grass moves, no clouds to catch the wind, no voices, there are no people. But there, by the birch, where the sun has lent it colour, skylarks, singing into the morning air. And they were really singing. They were. February. It was that incredibly hot February day when it got to 17 degrees later on on that day, um, which is phenomenal. Um, and then what better way to shake out your home and move on? That's it. Leave no trace. That's also a lovely way of just moving on, isn't it? Um, so we're going out and trying to record as much as we can. This is a few weeks later when the snow's returned. Rob uses uh, panoramic film cameras, uh, large format film cameras and digital. Yeah, I like carrying Get really heavy stuff. The heavier the better, because <laughs> you know, if it's not heavy, it's not hurting, they say. Yeah. Um, and then I make notes uh, whenever we go out and gradually filter through those, and they form blogs and, and website and poetry as well. Um, and we kind of think of some of this as if it's data of the heart. It's the feeling of place. It's, it's that thing that just makes you appreciate it or, or maybe look at things differently. Um, but that's only one side of the coin. The other is the knowing of place. Um, and so we're talking to people as we go along. Um, this is James Rebanks, whose farm is in the January quadrant of our clock. Um, somebody we've got to know over the years and we can talk to about his farming practice, about biodiversity, his goals for increasing um, environmental resilience on his farm. Um, we're working with a team of environmental scientists, analysts and modelers, which is really exciting um, to talk to a hydrologist or a soil specialist and then statisticians who actually make statistics exciting. And they tell jokes, statisticians. <laughs> we hadn't expected that. It's yeah. quite funny. Um, and it's all feeding into to what we're able to get to know about place. And we're monitoring as we go. So we're uh, GPS tracking our routes. We've got temperature monitors out in the landscape. So all being well, every 20 minutes. Um, for a year. For a year, we're recording temperature at the four cardinal points of the Lake District um, and looking at water quality as well in Tarns. So back to the map. To layer over what we feel as we go round, we're using this as a device to consider 12 different aspects of place. We're going to be talking to people, interviews of people who have local specialist knowledge as well as knowledge about these topics that relate to the more global stage. Um, sense of here, we chose the title because you've got to ask the question, how big is here? You know, is it right here? Is it the Lake District? Is it the world? Is my here the same as your here? How, how do we appreciate our space? Which elements do we not know about? Do we perhaps need to know a bit more about? And who do we need to bring together who can share their knowledge about these, these different areas of expertise? And uh, yeah, 
to help us learn um, and to help fund this project. We're really, really uh, thankful for the support we've got from our sponsors. Um, and the University of Cumbria, thank you. Um, the amount of expertise around us in this, in this county is fantastic. Um, mm. And we're going to be building on that through the year as we think about how this project develops. We're going to put that up as well. Mm -hmm. New partnerships, we welcome them. The thing about conversations is uh, the more they grow, the better they get. So, so as well as placing the, doing the talking, doing the feeling, we want to actually get involved with the artwork as well. We feel that's a real crucial part of what we're doing now going forwards. So we've got this canvas as a device which we're carrying around and placing it in each month as it moves around, forming this, this poem which is emerging over the period of time. So in January, in light of the IPCC report about uh, climate change and, and global warming and critical figures, uh, we placed this up um, near Keswick by Wolf Crags on the old coach road. So we took it out there in, in gorgeous light and placed it just off the track and then it spent about an hour just blowing in the light breeze and we took photographs of it and videoed it just to sort of gather the material and, and place that phrase in the landscape. That's what it's all about, yeah, placing and it words. Prompts thinking about heritage, looking back, looking forward, starting our journey around a clock face. So there's a lot, uh, lot we had to talk about, basically. It's good. February, um, the three main elements, I suppose you could say, that the Lake District is made up of, the sky, the land, and the water. Then on top of that are all the complexities, of course. But if you, if you bring it back to those simple elements, that's what it's all about. That was a challenging one. It was really windy. Uh, so we, we put it up once, swore a lot, took it back down again carefully because it was going to get blown away. So we moved a bit further around the beach at Owls Water and placed it for about 20 minutes. There was a real tension in that, though, because we couldn't leave it. You had to sort of watch it, it for fear of it being sort of <laughs> broken. And then a few weeks back, the March sector over by Hawes Water, we placed the third one. We left the question mark off because it didn't look right with a question mark. It is a question. Where is the wild? Um, and I think it's a really important question to ask. Where is the wild? You know, wild is within us, I think. Wild is still out there. Wild is everywhere if you look for it. And, and, and there is an ongoing discussion and debate, um, not just in the Lake District, but further afield, but about rewilding. And um, it's, language is a very interesting thing because it immediately sums up reactions and responses. So um, that's an ongoing discussion about rewilding and what that means and where the place for it is. So, so that was me shooting my panoramic camera. Uh, and I managed to develop the films just two days ago. So. You know, this is, this is hot off the dark room, so to speak. Um, and I'm just going to read a few notes that I made um, while I was sitting there. We began walking in just before seven, sky pale blue and pink, the air a riot of birdsong, trees all around us. We had a spot in mind on the open fell, but have decided after an hour that it's not right. Up here we're confronted by walls and fences, and no birds, save the odd lark fluttering from the grass, startled by our presence. We backtrack and dip into the woods. It is as if we are stepping into wild. This place is full of song. The tree roots and boulders are covered with moss. There are dead trees and live trees. There is a pulse. Life supported but not inhibited. Wild is a willed word, a willed and willing place. Rob is making photographs. I'm sitting on a rock looking at the ground. Hundreds of hazelnuts, brown curled leaves, branches and twigs, some coated with lichens, tufts of grass, small stones, wood sorrel, catkins. And beneath all this, a deep, dark soil made from years of a woodland's fallings and the curiosity and hunger of browsing animals stitched together with tree roots and fungi. There's a blue tit on a branch above the canvas, picking at grubs, bobbing and singing. Overhead, a buzzard mews, and the wind picks up, sending the old oaks into applause.
It's not just about us, though. It, it kind of never is, in a way. Um, we'd like you to get involved. Uh, we set the website up, and, and we've set up so we can, people can respond with questionnaires about their feeling of their own place, but also their feelings of the Lake District, if they've got any, if they've got any connection to the Lake District. So it's that global local again. Yeah, so um, it is about feelings. It's also about any concerns or any wishes for the future or kind of ideas of, of what might happen going forward. Um, it's exciting. Very, we feel quite excited about it at the minute. Uh, so when the questionnaire gets filled in, the, um, you, be, you, get, you get a place on a map. Um, so this on the website is interactive. We're working with Esri, which is uh, a mapping company that brings in data and then produces it pictorially. So if you click on a blue dot, <coughs> you can read somebody else's story. Um, and there are actually dots off, off the map. So wherever you are on the world, you can put your information in and find it. So we're looking forward to seeing this map grow and finding out what matters to people. And one of the really funky things about Esri is that it can make, um, among other things, it can make word clouds. So already there are some words that are coming out that people are using and we're kind of getting, just at the very start of this, beginning to get a feel for what it is that people value, perhaps emotionally, and then some of the concerns are a bit more kind of less emotional, more practical, if you can put it like that. Um, but yeah, so please, if you fancy having a look round and a scroll round, that is now active, which is very yeah. exciting. And, it, and it's for three reasons, really. It's to get us, as, so you can share your voice about your connection to place. It's also uh, specifically about the Lake District, so we can share it amongst the partners to get, so they can get a sense about a feeling of the landscape and maybe some of the challenges that may or may not be there, or the joys, of course, of being there. But also it will feed into our own artwork. The more sort of voices we hear, the more that it will feed into what we're actually going to be producing at the exhibition stage and when we uh, come to make the book further yeah, down the line. Yeah, and it's part of the wider conversation um, and a way of connecting people around a, a common theme. Um, and there's another map that's yet to be um, launched, which is the map of what we're discovering as we walk. So I said we were tracking our walks. The map will have the walks tracked, but also pins so you can find photographs video recordings or audio or details of conversations that we've had. So watch this space about another week or so. Yeah. And that should be ready. That's my job. <laughs> these, these are the main outputs as we see them from 2020 and beyond. I mean, this year it's all the gathering. You know, we have this gathering phase where we bring in all the information uh, and we get a greater understanding of the place, the knowing and the feeling of the place. But then we're going to be uh, doing these, these kind of funky things through next year and beyond. Uh, we're doing a, a, a sort of creating a young people's conference through the University of Cumbria, they're one of the partners, through 2020. We're doing an artist residency program, which is going to be run in conjunction with the Wordsworth Trust, the Wordsworth Museum, for the part of their, when they're newly opened in 2020. We're going to be doing public walks again, because we love taking folks out to the mountains and be able to sort of say about the place. I think that's really crucial. Similarly, schools work as well, about involving young people both inside the National Park and outside the National Park find out what connects them to this place. There'll be a book, there always is. And uh, the maps, as Harriet said, will keep growing. The, the people adding to the map, but also our map of place, how we're populating that map with our journeys, with our thoughts, with our feelings. That's, that's an interesting, we've put it out there because we want to make that happen, bringing together people perhaps with different agendas on different sides of the fence, different sides of the polarization in some senses, to perhaps talk about issues and see what may come of it. Yeah, and not in a way that involves defending a point of view, more in a way that is about sharing stories and uh, meeting one another across breaking bread, common ground. Um, so that's, that would be 2020, and we're looking forward to working with our partners to find out, and anybody else who wants to come and talk to us, to devise a, a way of doing that and see, see what happens. And we're going to keep walking and pausing and learning and sharing. And I like to think that the Lake District as the World Heritage Site and a national park is in a position to set an example. Um, so it's a space to be able to share from and to learn from conversations that are happening elsewhere. And I just wanted to 
share this to to finish up really in some sense is it's a often used quote by uh, the legend that is Sir David Attenborough no one will protect what they don't care about and no one will care about what they have never experienced and I think that's the crucial thing you need to experience something to know it and want to protect it so if, if generations or whoever is sliding away from that that knowledge of place that elemental connection to place then they're not going to want to care about it protect it uh, that's me dressed as one of kind of the Sherwood Forest lot. Um, I should have worn red because it stands out more. That's a tree I used to play in as a child when I was sort of 12, 13, 14. Uh, I found a way back into these woods. It's about half a mile from where I grew up in Pembrokeshire in South Wales. Um, so I've been going back for the last couple of years now and it's the wildest place I know pretty much anywhere on the planet I've been to. I've been to about 80 countries now. I've been to a lot of mountain ranges but this is one of the wildest places I know. It's not been gone into by humans for 30 years I've worked out or so. Fenced off, no grazers go in there. It is overgrown and the birds are singing like crazy. It's such a joyous place, it really is. Yeah, it means a lot to you, doesn't it? Um, I'm just gonna close with, um, that's a very big oak tree that Rob is in. Um, it's very big, everybody. <laughs> I'm not little, it's very big. And actually, to be inside that oak tree feels entirely different from just looking at it. So by the time you've climbed up it, it's worth it. Um, but this is a poem that I wrote um, with the oak tree that featured in the long view. <coughs> Time. Here we sit, waiting, waiting for the light to change. There may be nothing in this wide view to remark on, or everything. It is a way of seeing. Clouds shroud fells, summer shines subdued, rocks as old as time wear lichen cloaks and the day's warmth. The sun sinks, pulled into the unseen west. I lean into the trunk as if drawn in, heart to heart. Branches twist blacks against a darkening sky, moon as a pale apple. Waiting or rushing is a choice. For us, every action is a choice. And this tree could be a teacher, rooted, growing, in no hurry, settled <coughs> into the scheme of things. Um, so before we finish, you've seen pictures of the canvas out in the landscape. Um, so we've actually got it here. We thought we'd show you what it looks like. It looks like this. If we can find the holes, are you in? Pull it down a little bit. You have to move yours, I can't come forward. In? Yeah. There we go. So this is what we're taking out, but changing the words whenever it goes out. And this will be one of the lines that goes out later on in the year um, and for us relates, well, to everything really, culture, nature, everything. So um, thank you. Thank you very much.